Welcome to Ephemera. I am fantasy author Katie Brisky. And I'm editor Jen R. Albert. We hope you're enjoying our theme music courtesy of Alex White. Welcome to anybody who's joining us for the first time and welcome back to those of you who have visited our virtual home before. For those who are new, Ephemera is an award-nominated reading series chaired by Katie and myself. Pre-COVID, we held events in the Glad Day Bookshop. And while we await our triumphant return, we are cheered by having you here with us on YouTube. And we would like to begin tonight by acknowledging that the land on which I live and work is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. This land is covered under Treaty 13 and is part of the dish with one spoon. And the land on which I live and work uh, is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, the Neutral, the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas, and is covered with the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant. Additionally, this land is covered by the Between the Lakes purchase in 1792 between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Now, December is typically a time of celebration, a time to reflect upon the year on our accomplishments in particular. And since this was a year of immense difficulty, it feels even more important uh, this time to cheer any and all of our achievements. On paper, it might've seemed like a year we're celebrating when it comes to indigenous rights in Canada, or at least a year of some progress. We designated an official day of reflection with the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Day, an attempt to mark a new beginning. Um, an Inuk woman, Mary Simon, was appointed Governor General, the first Indigenous person to hold this title, and Canada seemed to finally be able to publicly reckon with some of the terrible legacy of residential schools. The realities of the system were long known, but were unacknowledged for far too long. The horrors locked away and denied, and a lot of things have come to light. I'm sure federal politicians would paint this year as a success in this manner. Um, we do have to temper progress with reality, of course, and make note of just how far we have to go still. Truth and Reconciliation Day, a national uh, level, at a national level felt very symbolic and only symbolic with not much reflection on what reconciliation really means, especially when our own prime minister op opted to go on vacation instead of attending indigenous ceremonies to which he was invited. Um, there was also outrage at the governor general appointment with her not being a French speaker and cruel commentary disparaging her attempted progress towards becoming one. All this despite the fact she is bilingual um, and isn't a Nuktitut speaker. Um, and the fact that indigenous languages spoken on this continent for thousands of years uh, are in danger of disappearing entirely and they're not offered the same protections as, as our official na uh, national languages. And of course, the all too common reaction to the realities of residence, residential schools, uh, people saying, oh, I'm sure it wasn't really that bad and condemnation of those looking to tear down the namesakes that honor people, the historical figures who initiated that genocide. Also the reluctance to say genocide. Uh, now Canada continues to encroach on indigenous lands, exploiting resources and polluting waterways, including the RCMP's continuous assault on the barriers put up in defense um, of the Wet'suwet'en First Nation um, in order to continue construction of the coastal gas link pipeline uh, without the First Nation's permission or approval. And so politicians are talking like indigenous communities are a priority, but nothing is more important to Canada than resource extraction. What do they say? Canada is just three mining companies in a trench coat. Uh, it's more true than we like to admit. It's embedded in our history and in our GDP. Um, and we talk the talk on a national level about reconciliation, but Canada's focus on resource exploitation is pretty well irreconcilable. We talk about reconciliation is irreconcilable with respecting Indigenous land rights. Um, this is the sort of thing we have to contend with before celebrating. And it's going to require substantial structural and institutional change. Um, in a time like this, we can be cheering our accomplishments, but it's it's easy in the year end retrospectives to focus on the successes and ignore the hard realities. It's a year that we've taken a few easy steps, but the climb is entirely uphill from here. Um, and you will see that I'm going to link to um, 
The Yellowhead Institution's uh, progress report, which just came out on the 94 calls to action presented by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, that was that came out six years ago, and they do a little report every year. So I'm going to link to that um, in the chat so that you can take a look at the progress actually made and the progress left to go. Thanks. I think Katie dropped. Oh, I can't hear you if you're talking. Oh, here. Oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> I was thwarted by technology, but I have returned, um, which is good because I'm excited for our theme tonight, which is Ottawa. But no, no, it isn't. Yes, that is our theme. All three authors and one of our performers are from or live in Ottawa. Ah. Oh. Ah, I see. This may have been a coincidence we've exploited for our amusement. Oh, man, I was looking forward to loading up the tour buses, although that might not be a good idea right now, um, alas. Uh, but I'm very pleased to introduce our first reader. Randall Trakildis is a writer, editor, and university professor based in Ottawa. Her short <laughs> fiction has appeared in science fiction and fantasy venues such as Podcastle and Strange Horizons, among others. Ranald is the founding editor of the Aurora-nominated Lackington's Magazine, an online SFF quarterly devoted to stories told in unusual or poetic language. Welcome, Ranald. Thank you for having me. Um, I was a little concerned about the theme of cheer that I think is also in the air tonight, and I can't say that my stories contain a lot of cheer, so I chose to turn to a newer story that's out on submission, and it features a character who is nearly perpetually cheerful, despite some hideous circumstances. Um, here's a man with a very sunny disposition who loves people, but who, because of conquest of his homeland, has lost his loved ones and even his identity. And the story is one of several shorts that I'm putting together of various characters who are surviving under this vicious regime in a country called Oz. And the first one of these stories is forthcoming in Kaleidotrope next year. But the one I read from tonight features, um, for context, a somewhat supernatural warrior who's lost his order to the invading forces. He still retains some mystical fighting prowess, but he has to get creative in how he is able to use it. And a quick content warning that it, much of the action from the passage I'm reading takes place on a cliffside. So anyone who's nervous about heights, uh, consider yourself forewarned about that. Um, the story is called Poor Lauren, and a brief epigraph reads, Redler, a definition. One who sells tinctures to sheep farmers, so herds or individual animals can be more easily distinguished, e.g. to mark rams for castration. The rodent almost gnaws into his hand, he almost loses his grip and falls to his death, which would have surprised him. His blood would have mixed with the reddish dust that covers the landscape here, a jumble of escarpments that spike to the north of Quorum. And no one would have mourned him, for Loran was made a ghost five years ago. With a cursing hiss, he summons his every atom, which obey improbable calls. He dances against the pole that sucks him towards the ground and would snap his bones if it could, even his. His hands claw into the rock, excavating desperate grooves. His toes reclaim their purchase. One heartbeat after his miss, Lauren is part of the cliffside, panting against the quartz. He's a splaying, long-limbed thing, as sure as the rock. His relief manifests in a grin. He can rarely help it. He smiles up at the biter as he settles the pulse in his chest. The nut seek is vehement as it paces along a protrusion that juts out from the hole where it makes its home in the cliff face. From within comes the chatter of many more companions, a scurry of summer fat creatures as round as melons, gorged on buttery summer groundnuts. They have whittled a ramp between their cave and the overhang above Lauren's head like little engineers. Their den is most strategic, not quite enough. Lauren, quicker than rodents when he likes, catches a nut seek by the scruff and hurls it from its perch. With a piercing squall, it falls hundreds of feet onto the hard pack. It might have bounced like a cat, but the distance is too great. A little snap reaches Lauren's ears, and with a mix of pity and appetite, 
He watches the creature circle around in the reddish dust on useless limbs. He'll feast on nut sweet meat tonight in his caravan. He grins again. He didn't clamber up this escarpment to hunt a meal. The rodent is a bonus, a reward for an afternoon's work. He's been an insect on this wall for hours now, two burlaps nearly filled with chunks of auric. They hang from both of his shoulders, their straps across his chest, but their weight can't trouble Loran, who is stronger than his leanness would suggest. When his sacks are filled to the brim, he'll return to solid ground, but not before. A dampened clump of hair obscures too much of his vision. Loran jerks his head and pushes what he can back into its tie with one free hand. He pulls a trowel from his belt and digs at the precious auric to his left below the nuts he burrow. It crumbles easily, never too resistant when he coaxes it from the quartz where it makes its ancient home. This load is nearly as large as the damaged nut seek down below, waiting to perish. The load is greasy in his hand. That is part of the challenge now when he seeks his materials. Before conquest five years ago, shepherds bought redler dyes made from easily harvested sen, a sticky sumac that proliferates close to the ground. Sen is a deep magenta and it's the color of the deformer. None of Lauren's people can bear that crimson purple anymore. Most yank it up by the roots and burn it down to ashes whenever it has the affront to bloom and os his conquered homeland. That red signals weapon men who flash it on their boots and belts. Some sumac grows remain kept by unfortunate milliners who are forced to make those leathers. Their fingernails bear shameful moons of sendai. Lorenz are brightly marked by redler's auric. He never has to hide his hands. His trowel creates a fall of delicate reddish sand, which almost makes a song as it titters down the cliffside. The lump of auric jiggles in its nook, and with a breath locked in his lungs, he twists the trowel until he can get two fingers into position below the handle. One needs more than daring to harvest auric this high up. One needs the supple wrist and spidery digits of Loran's kind to complete this task one-handed. With a groan, the load drops in his palm against the trowel, and Loran places it gratefully in a sack. If one were to study this cliffside from the ground, a story of excavation would unfold. Other redlers and dyers, with the help of ladders and scaffolds, pried what they could of the auric from the bottom of the escarpment, which is now uniformly quartz. The lower wall shines in the daylight, while the higher ones, a pimpled face full of reddish pustules that only Loran will tackle. He's returned to this wall every summer since he was declared a ghost, patiently cleaning its complexion. Another fruitful load beckons to the left of the nut seeks. He belts his trowel, wipes his slippery hand against his hip, then reaches for a bulb of rock with a graceful stretch. His motion might stop the heart of any watcher from below, but Lauren is certain. He's a fluid gloss of glue as he shimmers over, avoiding the lip of the burrow where other biters rove. There is no one to witness this, for the escarpment is an hour's ride from nearby Quorum and the ground too silty for farming. It ripples with depressions that would exhaust a plower. The loudest sounds are the panic yelps of the nut seek down below and the distant ringing of the scaffold bell in Quorum's main square, summoning locals to endure some grisly display. Lauren shuts out the ladder, for rage is not conducive to this venture against the cliff. Some minutes later, when the bell has stilled and the nutseek barely whimpers, Lauren's burlaps are full. It takes him inhuman seconds to find his way down the side of the cliff, leaving holes in the stubborn rock. He leaps the final stretch after dropping his sacks to the hard pack. Without any thought at all, he twists in the yawning air, rotates like a wheel made of leaf or wing or cloud, somersaults across the ground and rises grandly in one piece. No one saw him. He was sure to scan the landscape before this liberation. He takes a moment to retie his hair, which is dark as the nuts that fatten the rodent at his feet. He is good at making dyes, especially for tresses. When his color is freshly applied, it's the common sheen of shade nut. When he lets the dye fade a bit, his hair is like walnut flesh, a model of different browns. Either is preferable here in Southern Os, and either is safer by measures for ghosts like Lauren. When his ball of hair is neatened, he straps on his sacks again, picks up the writhing nutseek, and breaks its neck. A fine reward indeed, and one that will bring some warmth to his caravan. 
Now, if we were to continue reading, which I can't because the story is way too long, 8,000 words, we'd learn that dye making isn't just Lauren's livelihood now, but it's sort of a canny cover as he roams around his homeland, assassinating key targets and yearning for a lost love, but yet he smiles. So thanks for listening, everyone, and good share. I love it. <laughs> I mean, I've always loved like the richness of your worlds, and I confess I don't love heights, but I'm quite content <laughs> to join in vicariously at that level of imagery and detail. So thank you very much for that. Cool. <sighs> I'm still stuck on Ottawa. I mean, Ottawa still reminds me of CanCon, and I wish we were on the CanCon spaceship right now. That would that would cheer me up. If we could have some holiday festivity with our Ottawa friends. Yeah. Well, maybe uh, imagination could help us. We have that. I mean, we're going to make stuff up and call that good. <laughs> That's fiction for you. Okay, audience, we need directions. How do we get to the CanCon spaceship? Wrong answers only. You can put your roots in the chat or answer on Twitter. And I, uh, I for one, can't wait to see how we get to the CanCon spaceship. Wrong answers only. <laughs> Definitely no right answers here. Okay, in the meantime, I am very pleased to introduce our second reader. Brandon Curley has been previously published by Daily Science Fiction, Fusion Fragment, Pulp Literature, Flame Tree Publishing, and other markets. He is also a conference organizer for CanCon, where we're trying to get to, <laughs> uh, an Aurora-nominated podcaster, reviewer at Blackgate, a history teacher, and a game master for a bunch of other writers via his charity project, Bag of Giving. You should check it out. Brandon is not busy at all. Uh, clearly, he needs a little bit, uh, a few more projects. His debut fantasy novel, Catalyst, is forthcoming from Athis Arts in late 2022. Find him at brandoncurley.com or on Twitter at B underscore Curly. Welcome. Thanks, Jen. Um, yeah, I, I do a lot. I always forget until I hear the description in my bio. I'm like, I do a lot. Um, this is phenomenal. It is so cool to be here um, as part of this Ottawa invasion. Um, so, you know, waving at everybody uh, out there. Um, I was in a similar boat as Ranald um, in trying to figure out a story that um, connected with cheer. Um, so I'm going to read uh, the first bit from my story, Solomark, uh, which came out in the seventh issue of uh, Fusion Fragment, which I have right here, um, and which Ranald is also actually in, which is kind of cool. Um, and uh, it opens at a rock concert where people are cheering. So that, that's, my, uh, that's my connection to the theme. Um, <laughs> I can see Katie dancing in the background. Um, and uh, a slight content warning, um, there's some mention of uh, death recorded on film, um, kind of like live death. So just a uh, quick content warning there for anyone um, in case that's useful. Uh, so yeah, so this is the first bit of uh, Soul Mark. I'm used to hearing people over cheers and drum solos, but the woman with the dragonfly wings throws me for a second. You want to what? I want to dazzle him. The woman stretches, showing off the glitter on her bare neck and arms. People lean away from her translucent wings. Definitely not a prop, like I thought they were when they were folded behind her garrison and the matchsticks t-shirt. Great. Instead of using magic wings to, I don't know, rescue people from forest fires, if they're that functional, she thinks they're going to earn a backstage pass. I pitch my voice over the audience as the matchsticks finish a song. Lee's not interested, and you aren't crossing this. I point at the metal railing separating the amphitheater seats from the pit. Dragonfly, Dragonfly Lady sways in place for a minute, either surprised by my response or, no, that's something else from the way her cheeks flush under the glitter. My hand stops halfway to my earpiece when those wings flex again. If Dragonfly Lady got her soul's worth from her deal, the Molson 76th might be trending tonight. She should have been turned away at the door, but now she's my problem. Snapping my fingers catches her attention. My hand drifts down to the railing, grips it, and crushes it like putty. That sobers her up. She looks for a soul mark, but maybe realizing for the first time that not everyone who makes a deal is as obvious about it. All I do is smirk. Dragonfly Lady withers, wings folding down, and she steps into the crowd. On the stage behind me, the matchsticks launch into Wayward and Lonesome. I grip my teeth and almost put another dent in the railing since that song is not supposed to be on tonight's set list. Apparently, I'm doomed to live out my last days being proven right all the time. I gesture for in-house security to take my place. Halfway to the stage, Horatio blasts my ear. Fuck's sake, he's going into the crowd again. 
Of course, I already know that, but Lee's manager is usually a step behind. Being the matchstick's security head means acting quick to avert disaster, like some drunk winged fangirl flying onto the stage, or Lee being a dumbass. The fans singing along to Lonesome ignore me marching between the stands and the pit. They've only got eyes for Lee Garrison, ambling down the thrust stage, one hand raised like a Baptist preacher in leather and denim. The pit audience can't reach him. Security checks for all sorts of wacky stuff at the door these days, ever since that idiot with the extendable arms at the Fistful of Awesome show. They wave and cheer, and Lee continues unharmed toward where the thrust stage meets Area 3. People don't see the other side of a concert. I get it. Between the sound, the lights, and the energy, you get lost in a live show. That's your right, since you paid for the escape. Or you're watching a YouTube video like Girl, da Girl Dances on Stage with Springsteen and wishing you were the one holding hands with a rock star. Except live shows aren't magical for us. The Molson 76th holds 17,000 people, each of them a potential problem. And I'm not even talking about someone sneaking a soul mark, a knife, or some coke inside. Maybe that girl at Springsteen's show trips and takes the boss down with her. Or one of the lovely excited fans reaching from the front row pokes Lee in the eye by mistake and destroys his cornea. Or he almost breaks his neck going into the crowd. Again. Taking the crew stairs two at a time brings me to area three as Lee hops off the stage, three steps from the stands. Karina and Tomas flank him as he belts out the chorus to Lonesome. The fans scream even louder when he starts shaking hands and giving high fives. No one's bothered by the sweat dripping from his tousled brown hair or staining the front of his shirt. Messy God is still a God. Lee climbs the railing for the final chorus and the audience grabs at him, but I get there first, grabbing his leather jacket. Karina and Tomas watch the crowd, knowing that Lee isn't going anywhere now, except back up stage once he's done. While Lonesome fades, Lee's stare is intense. I think he's spotted something that I won't like, but nothing catches my eye in the crowd. For a half second, he looks disappointed, I think. He's all smiles again when he drops from the railing, probably landing too hard on his knees. I give him my shoulder as he climbs, as he climbs back on stage. The thing is, Lee Garrison is just a guy. Everything special about him is genuine, which is part of why he's still popular, 20 years and 13 albums into his career. Unlike too many younger musicians these days, Lee's ability didn't come from a deal. Luckily for him, mine did. After every show, Lee slams two glasses of water backstage, shares congratulations with the band, and spends a 10-minute decompression in whatever green room the venue sets aside. For some rockers, that means blow or conjuring iguanas or whatever, but Lee, for Lee, it's truly a moment to come down from the high of doing what he loves. I don't give him that moment tonight. When I step inside, Lee's facing the mirror at the back, in a fresh t-shirt, hastily wiping tears from his eyes. That throws me more than Dragonfly Lady, even though I've seen the man shirtless upside down in a chocolate fountain or in a dozen other embarrassing moments before he got sober. Uh, sorry, Vic, something in my eye. The tears are gone when Lee turns to face me. Uh, what's up? Since I don't have much imagination, I tell him, I came here to scold you. Lee looks confused for a second until his face lights up and he starts to laugh. He, he plops down on a sofa. All right, lay, lay into me, Vic. Somehow this lanky middle-aged man-child reminds me of Carter whenever I caught him on YouTube instead of doing homework. Now I'm the one looking away. Lee shifts on the couch. I didn't actually worry you, did I? I shake off the memory as I frown at him. You're supposed to stay on stage. If Horatio didn't have a stroke, he's on his way down. That's for, wait, five shows in a row, Lee? The rule was that you stay on stage for half of your shows until the doctor clears you. Disappointed you, didn't I? He says, offering a grin. Yeah. I try to make it clear with one word how serious I am. I don't have the time for him to bullshit and not take care of himself, especially since he won't have me forever. Lee scratches the side of his head. Look, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have gone out there. I figure that's it, but he adds something that doesn't sound like Lee. No excuse either, being selfish. Garrison and the Matchsticks perform almost year round, sometimes as many as 18 shows a month, only breaking to record albums or when someone has a baby. Why? No joke, it's because of the fans. Lee will do any charity invite he can, small venues or large, sign memorabilia or take a selfie, and even insists on a certain percentage of every show's profits going to local charities. He said to me once, I love music, but the fans love the show. Thinking back to that expression on his face earlier, I ask, what were you looking for tonight? He leans forward, hands clasped together over his knees. You ever regret taking your deal? For a second, I feel Sinister Shad's hand tracing the soul mark on my neck. No one asks me about it anymore. They know the basics, Horatio and the execs know when my time is up, and that's enough for everyone. I say, every day. Don't tell me you're thinking of taking one. 
Eh, shit, no, just things on my mind. Got me curious. He lays back against the sofa. Looking for a face in the audience. She wasn't there tonight, so never mind. I want to ask him who, but the door slams open and Horatio starts roaring. By the time he's done, we're overdue getting Lee on the bus, and I have more pressing things to worry about than his questions and his tears. We hit Burlington on Friday and check in at the Delta. The matchsticks have sold out shows Saturday and Sunday. In between, I'm off duty and head to my local downtown haunt, Kemblings, attached to a brewery and named after some dead MP. The music is low, only half the polished oak tables are, ev are even full, and the place's theme has nothing to do with the Bible. I've never understood why the whole angels and demons fad never faded. The beings going around granting soul marks aren't demons. I remember a dealer on TV saying once that it's actually sort of offensive. That year, something like four separate movies popped up about good demons facing prejudice. You can't escape them completely, though. Every now and then, the flat screens show a commercial for a dealmaker firm. The news talks about some well-known Canadian whose clock ran out recently. Tonight, they're repeating a story about the latest timeout who recorded his last day. But yeah, those sorts of reminders are everywhere, so they don't bother me. But I don't like when a teacher walks into Kemplings. Most of them wear all black, which doesn't help their image much. Sinister Shad told me they can see black more clearly, but mostly the government mandated red pin stands out more on dark clothes. This one looks almost middle-aged, round-faced, vaguely Caucasian, but stooped like someone twice as old. The redness around his eyes stands out more than most dealers, and his lips are pulled back more, showing off a grin filled with way more teeth than necessary. Part of me wishes the Secrecy Act hadn't forced the dealers to stop masquerading as humans. Their attempt to make it clear they aren't is a little too freaky sometimes. My regular haunts are where dealers don't show up, but something's changed here. There's a drink waiting at the end of the bar. The dealer doesn't leer or lean into anyone's personal space as he goes to collect it. Anyone who meets his eyes gets a polite nod and he, as he sorts out the curious from the potential clients. The dealer's grin widens when he spots me. Sometimes they like to talk to soul marked. Supposedly there's a black market for negotiating or transferring souls against the dealer's own rules. I focus on the nearest flat screen, which is the only reason why I see the news before the bar gets loud. Garrison sold, rocker made deal, source says. In the image behind the reporter, Lee's wearing gray denim and that genuine smile hands spread like someone trying to emphasize his honesty. A wet hooting sound like an owl being drowned hits my right ear. It's the dealer, wide mouth open as he laughs. And the sound chases me out the front door. And that's where I'll stop. If you want to read the rest, Fusion Fragment, issue seven. Ah, Brandon, you're so good at just like putting in these like super casual hints and then you go, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, your pacing is good. So I want to come to Ottawa to see you. How are we getting there? Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> there's some very good suggestions in chat um, uh, uh, via Moose, uh, or we steal a Tardiff, or uh, we say Derek Kunskin three times in the mirror at midnight, uh, or uh, you have to ask Marie for the special glitter to reveal the portal, the glittery portal, I assume, to the CanCon spaceship. Certainly. Um, or it looks like you need to go through a pointlessly long journey, then learn that you could have got to the CanCon spaceship right at the beginning of the journey by clicking our heels together three times. There's no place like Con. <laughs> um, I also suggest we could take Guinness. <gasps> I'm sure he could get us there. Um, so if we're going on a road trip, and it sounds like we have many different options, uh, we need to name our vehicle. Okay. I think this calls for a vote, uh, a vote. I think we could name it a uh, glitter stag. Combining both of us, I, I like it. Um, I also like cheery McCheer face. Okay, Autobot, like Autobot, but it's Ottawa. I think that's good. Uh, glitter stag, cheery McCheer face or Autobot. Uh, vote in the chat or on Twitter. And while you choose the name of our intrepid vehicle, I'm pleased to introduce tonight's performance by the Nutcracker Messiah Choral. The Nutcracker Messiah Choral was formed under mysterious circumstances at an unspecified time. Periodically, they convene to perform their singular work, a staggering mashup of musical genius, combining the music of Handel's Messiah with the story of the Nutcracker. Tonight, the Nutcracker Messiah Chorale is led by Neela Rajagopal. Hailing from Ottawa, Neela is a choral conductor and soprano. 
She holds her master's in choral conducting from McGill University. On the harmonium, we have Adrienne Ross, a historical keyboard musician specializing in harpsichord and clavichord. He recently completed his master's of historical performance at the University of Toronto. Additionally, the Nutcracker Messiah Chorale wishes to thank the many volunteers whose fine mus musicianship, film editing skills, and good humor bring this spectacle to life. All right, let's get the share up. Share and sound, we're going. Welcome to the Nutcracker Messiah Chorale. There were children abiding in their beds as the clock crept in the turbid night. And lo, the mouse king of the bed came upon them, and the scratching of the claws was wrought upon them, and they were so afraid. And the mouse king said unto them, Fear me, for behold, I bring you grim tidings of no joy, which a bit of our children. For unto you I come this night with my rod and an army to fight you and to break your toys. So oh, yeah, if you've ever wondered if the Nutcracker and the Messiah can be combined, uh, the answer is yes, they can be. Uh, so what is our illustrious vehicle going to be called? It looks from chat like Glitter Stag. The votes are in. Ah, that was the top choice on Twitter as well. Uh, so great, we have a route. We have our trusty vehicle, the Glitter Stag. 
Um, but what, do we have an expression of cheer with which to greet our Ottawa friends? Hmm, good point. We definitely need one of those. Uh, happy holidays, season's greetings. I'm a little unconventional in my greetings, um, like ahoy or how hops it, um, salutations and felicitations, or, you know, just like a jaunty tip of the hat. Okay. Well, everybody, tell us your own uh, greetings of cheer. To claim them in a joyful voice and be sure to put your cheers in the chat or on YouTube so we can all hear them. Uh, uh, but in the meantime, I am very uh, pleased to announce our final reader tonight. Suyi Davies Okongboa is a Nigerian author of fantasy and science fiction. He has written works for young readers, the latest of which is Minecraft, The Haven Trials. That sounds fun. He was one of 17 contributors to the number one New York Times bestselling middle grade anthology, Black Boy Joy. He lives in the snowy city of Ottawa, Canada, like everyone here tonight. Thanks for coming, Suyi. Thank you. <laughs> um... I'm gonna start by saying that was, um, well, well, I'm glad to be here. I only just moved to Ottawa like um, this year. So I'm only like six months in, um, but proud to be <laughs> uh, one of the many here. Um, the other thing is like, so that bio is the bio that, um, I, that I usually use for like younger readers. <laughs> so I'm sure like when I sent in like, you know, I had like one brain cell missing, but, um, but like if you, <laughs> uh, if you like look out there, you will find that I also write works for adults, which is great. Um, and so what I'm gonna read here is um, from one one genre or subgenre that I often don't um, don't get to you know say that I write, which is quote unquote horror. Uh, and I use this because it somewhat moves across the spectrum um, and I write across the spectrum. So I'm reading a short um, tale from the most recent anthology that I pub um, got published with my, my story in it. It's called, um, it's a lengthy title, but the short form is a travel anthology of the most haunted buildings in the world. Fictional buildings, of course. Um, <laughs> And I have a story in it called The Case of the Moaning Marquee. Um, and I'm, I'm just gonna, for a preface, I'm just gonna read a short intro because this is like a travel log. So this is the usual short note that goes before it. Uh, and I would uh, sort of challenge you to uh, figure out which, <laughs> uh, which part of the canon you know, it is playing with. Um, so the intro says, this next story is fun uh, and a wonderful play on the, mo on the world's most famous detective duo set in modern time, reimagined if they were Nigerian and also if they were a witch doctor and a dog. The concept is more than elementary, my dear Watson. The case of the morning marquee. It is not often in Lagos that you find a man and his dog by a street corner at 7.30 p.m. on a Sunday, idly regarding an ordinary marquee tent in a lecky suburb, or shall I say an otherwise ordinary marquee tent. It does look very ordinary, I say to Shylock, who sits on the ground next to me. See, they, they haven't even cleaned up the place yet. Shylock snorts, then says, but we should be glad. Well, he doesn't say it per se because dogs can't talk. And I only, and only I can hear what he says and only has thoughts in my head. But Shylock is not a dog or, or not just. I haven't yet dis decided upon a word to describe his predicament. An Alsatian walking around with a once renowned private detective's still functional brain in him with said brain telepathically connected to me, his once best friend. A dirty scene is a detective's best dream, Shylock expounds. Cleanliness is bad for business. As with most things, he offers this information in flat affect, the subtleties of physical conversation lost when all you receive are words in your head, a phone call from the beyond. But I completely understand, and I'm okay with this, if my consciousness of sorts was trapped in a dog, 
I wouldn't waste time parsing the nuances of human communication either. I'm yet to fashion a retort before our client arrives, riding in the back of a commercial keke tricycle that comes around the bend. He gets down, pays the rider, who zooms off. Sorry for keeping you waiting, he says, flustered from the ride. He's a gentleman of stout stature, dark complexion, and languid comportment. He holds out his hand. Olalikon Bashiru, but you can call me Lekon. You are the owner? I ask, shaking my hand, shaking his hand. Oh, no, 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 he says. You spoke with my brother, Banky. He's CEO of Bash Tents and Rentals. I'm chief of, chief of operations. He looks me over. And you must be the witch doctor. He says this without qualm. I don't look like much, not in this up and down brocade that has since lost its shine. I'm also 42, which is younger than most people expect for witch doctor types. But again, most people have never had cause to meet one of us and therefore have zero idea what we actually do and look like. The way this guy responds, no quips, no comments, it tells me he's probably already met with a witch doctor in his life. I'm not sure if that says something good or bad about him. I'm Dr. John, I say, and angle my head towards the dog. That is my associate, Shylock. Ah, so that's the other half of Shylock and John associates. He, he clicks the back of his tongue as if he's just discovered something exquisite. A client's response to meeting Shylock often tells me a lot about them. Most of them are unsure if they'll be meeting two witch doctors and are often taken back to learn that Shylock is not a person. Well, not a person to them, I often find it wise to hold back the truth that I'm the witch doctor. Shylock is the real brains of the operation. I'm just a tag along who gets to sniff out any possible supernatural elements. Most often there are none, and I do nothing but relate to the clients whatever Shylock has deduced. But sometimes it turns out I'm needed more than expected. Lekon's response to Shylock is attempting to pat his head. Shylock growls in a low register, bearing enough teeth to set him back. The man retrieves his hand promptly. Doesn't like strangers, eh? He says, chuckling. Alsatian? Human, I say. More truth in the word than I mean. Nobody likes non-consensual touch. I point towards the marquee. Do you mind? Sure, sure, he says, taking out a key to open up the gates to the chain link fence. He swings it open and beckons us to go inside. You're not coming, I ask. Inside there, he frowns. Didn't Banky tell you about, he glances aside as if checking to see if anyone is listening, about the event? The ghost, you mean? I say. Yes, he told me the Marquis is haunted. It's not the Marquis, Lecon, Lecon says. Maybe the land, I don't know. No matter how many times we've changed the Marquis itself, every tent we put in there gets. Haunted? Yeah, he gestures inside. Maybe you can see for yourself. It's pitch dark when Shylock and I enter into the tent. So I turn on my fo uh, phone's flashlight app. Shylock, who no longer needs as much light now that he has dog eyes, scurries off and gets about his business, sniffing every corner, making deductions that I can't help but overhear. Crime, they always say. Shylock ponders, yet the grass smells nothing but ornery, the floor is simply unkempt, Bizarre events do not always mean criminal. He's referring to what the owner had said when he made the call to me, informing us that he needs our services. Somebody buried, planted, I don't know, something on that land, he said. I need someone with your expertise to find it and dig it out. I wasn't sure if he wanted us to find the person or the hunt, so I came along with Shylock just in case it was either. But now, standing in the dark, holding up the meager light from my phone, a coldness engulfs me. The kind that only I and my ilk know is not physical, but, but spectral in nature. I realize that Banky might not have known this when hiring us, but he indeed needed both our services. There is something lurking here, something cold and angry about being held back from freely crossing into its rightful place in the world beyond this one. This entity, whatever it is, is not in the land, as they say. It is inside the marquee, in the very cloth of the tent. 
And though the drawn plaintive moan, the initial spot I claim to have heard is absent, I know exactly what you have sounded like. I lift my phone higher and I look through the tent. Nothing about it is spectacular. It looks like every other marquee for hire in Lagos for weekend weddings and other parties. All the lights are off, but orange draperies hide the tent's floors and PVC walls. But that is where the ordinariness of the scene ends. Everything else present tells us the story of the abandoned party the day before. Half eating place of food, half drunk glasses, of, uh, half, dr half drunk glasses scattered about, stinking with a day's worth of decay, microphones still attached to their stands, the band's equipment left behind, chairs congregated about tables, with personal effect left personal effects left behind in the rush to exit the party. The original screamer wasn't wrong, though. My 10 years of witch doctor practice are picking up this presence of a specter of sorts. The specter itself is already gone, but its telltale signs linger. The feeling of being watched even with no eyes about, the sudden draining of energy from the atmosphere as if all color has been stripped away, the strange smell of sick, of rotting, which might in this case be the food, but not always, and the cold, always the cold. But I'm not interested in the presence or absence of the spectre. What I'm interested in are the two key questions to ask about spectres. Why here and why now? I wonder about to the toilets where the scream that brought forth the mayhem was understood to have originated. Shylock is already there, sniffing about for clues. The original screamer in this case had reported seeing something fleeting in the mirror, as well as heard the moaning. The possibility of hallucinations has been floated, but this was sadly not the first time someone was reporting a haunted bash tents and rentals marquee. Is there really a ghost? Shylock asks. I seem to find nothing of criminal import, so please tell me there's a spirit here. There is, I say, feeling the signs of ghostly presence intensify as a step into the cubicle. And no, it's not in the land, it's in the marquee. Okay, Shylock says. So we answer the questions. You go first, I say. Why here? Why now? Shylock takes his time to ponder. They did say they've changed the, the tent multiple times, correct? He asks. They did. And the staff and the equipment. Even this location, the land itself, it's a new one. So we are to believe Maybe the business itself is haunted? That doesn't hold up to, to deduction. Indeed, it doesn't, I say, holding up my light to the mirror. And that's when I see it. A word written on the glass of the mirror, not written for the average eye to see. But the witch doctor's eye is akin to steam on this glass, unearthing words etched by a dry finger, especially if that finger does not sprout from a human hand, but a ghostly one, scratching across the mirror. Over and over, the only word that it knows, the same word that brought it here, that keeps it coming back. The writing on the mirror uses no alphabet. It's all symbols and drawings, language from a time long before the arrival of English in this country. It is also one I can immediately connect to a specific person far away from here. The only person I know who might have an idea what this word is doing on the mirror of a random marquee in Lecky. I pull out my notebook, draw the symbols as best as I can, and then next to it, note the best English equivalent of the word I can muster. It reads, ghost writer. Come, I say to Shylock, we have an old foe to visit. Thank you. Thank you, man. I kept feeling like I could close my eyes and just be straight there. It was so vivid. Um, and I admit I cackled at ghost writer. <laughs> Um, so what are some of our expressions of cheer? Uh, I'm snowing. Yes, I'm just we're all clicking, snowing. clicking, we're all snowing. <laughs> <laughs> clicking a lot of things. Uh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> Lana says, y'all want to come serenade me while I paint? Uh, Kari says, you shall not pass. <laughs> Uh, Grail says, I think the pandemic has made social interaction too awkward. Say more than hello. Very true. <laughs> awesome. Um, I mean, from Twitter, we, we didn't get any on Twitter. 
So I will make one up right now and say, great galloping glitter stags. That's pretty good. That's pretty good for improvisation. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that was a strange trip on the glitter stag, but I hope our expressions of cheer have reached their intended destination. Indeed, this is our way of saying that we hope our planned Ottawa convoy can happen sometime soon. Happy holidays and wassail from Prancy to Ottawa and CanCon. And to all of you in YouTube land, for those traveling in slightly more conventional ways over the next couple of weeks, please stay safe, take care, and remember to download the ArriveCan app if you are leaving Canada. And until next time, please don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Ephemera Series, and please subscribe to this YouTube page. We would like to thank the Toronto Arts Council, the Ontario Arts Council, and the science fiction and fantasy writers of, their, of America for their funding assistance. And as we close out tonight, we'd also like to thank our fabulous readers and musicians, composer Alex White, our friends, families, loved ones, and you. Thank you for staying with us. Um, hope you have a cheerful holiday season, and we will see you for our next event on January 19th, right here on YouTube. <laughs>